Kesto Staini Nanambra State, the presidential candidate of the Labour Party in the February presidential elections, Peter Obi, has uh, was cited, uh, has cited vote buying as one of the major factors that influenced voters' decision during Saturday's House of Assembly election. In an exclusive interview with Arise News after casting his vote at his residence in Agulu, he notes that the country has returned to the era of transactional politics, with some top government officials getting involved in vote buying. Yaeva says that people should not take the euphoria experienced during the presidential polls to meaning that the Labour Party will make significant impact during the governorship and state houses of assembly polls. Today is the local election. The governorship election, Labour Party is not even presenting candidate in modern. Out of the 28 states that they're contesting today, I can say we have governorship candidate in about eight. So we okay, won't be sweeping. And then going below that is the House of Assembly, which again is a different kind of election. People are going to elect people based on their local peculiarities. Even me going to my to my village and people are telling that people came with POS and are transferring money to people as they vote. They're even telling me, well, I have never participated in vote buying and I've never. It is wrong and will never help in building a better society. And we have joining us in the studio um, right now, Arise News Analyst, Dr. Constance Ikoku, and uh, also joining her in our offside studio, Kenneth Eze, who is the Executive Director of Speak Out Africa Initiative. Well, we've been told that Dr. Constance will probably join us uh, in a matter of uh, minutes. Well, uh, let's go to Kenneth quickly in our overflow studio. Well, Kenneth, we've seen reports from different civil society organizations with regards to rating uh, the elections, especially when you compare it to what we saw about three weeks ago. In your opinion, opinion, would you say we've seen an improvement in the process, you know, especially with regards to INEX performance and even security agents compared to um, the presidential? Okay, thank you. Um, for us at the civil society, uh, is a missed assessment. Uh, to your question, I would say yes, in terms of the process this time around, uh, we saw an improvement. And by that I mean early arrival, and early starting of most of the, more than 90%, if not more, of the polling unit across different con uh, states, the 28 states where gubernatorial election and state assembly was conducted, election started very early. Um, we saw very robust, viable logistic plans and um, execution as against what we saw in the last uh, February 25th presidential national assembly election. Uh, we saw functioning of, um, you know, an improved also aspect in the area of beavers uh, functioning uh, with just pocket of few places where uh, maybe we we'll say that beaver did not uh, function. Then, and we saw total compliance, which was what Nigeria yearned for in the aspect of keeping to the guideline of INEC itself and also the electorate, which by this I mean the transmission to the IREF portal, the INEC review election results portal. Uh, as we speak today, we had less work to do at the civil society because we were, we have said, we're seeing results as it's tripping in. And as we speak now, elections results are coming in. We can tell you a uh, percentage of states results that have been released. So we saw improvement in the aspect of process. But in the area of participation, we got it wrong. It was a sad day in terms of participation. Uh, more than 80, 85 percent across from our own report has recorded low voter turnouts. And when we talk about violence, for violence, in fact, we saw violence skyrocketed. And we saw this earlier. We have raised several alert, alerting the security agency and the INEC on hot spots, places like Lagos, it was not news, 
places like Imo, we saw it earlier. Places like Ebony State, we saw it. We went to the extent of calling on security agency to tell them what is going to be likely to happen. For example, like Lagos, the ethnic coloration, the voter suppression, it, 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 it was heightened. In fact, elections in most places are nothing to write home about. And so this, to us, is a missed uh, feeling. But for us, as a civil society, this is a setback to us. We are not happy that all the efforts, you would agree with me that the civil society has been on this effort, even when we are not the direct beneficiary, to ensure that we have a new electoral act. And all the struggles, all the protests, some of us are no longer alive. People like Ari Yato Yedare and many other people were the wrong, were the son. And at the end of everything, we saw these efforts being rubbished on the platter of what we call human interference. You know, and we saw the result today. And so many people, for the first time, we saw people in River State, across state board, playing football, young people. And when you ask them, the reason they tell you is that they are disappointed, they are disillusioned, and that the, the results of February 25th did not reflect their aspiration. And so they have no other alternative than to conclude that their results will not, will not count. And so we did all we could do. Because this is as if we are going to start afresh again, to begin to build afresh the trust. We have always said that the, the, the survivor of the electoral empire, INEC, solely depends on trust and confidence, not anything. And so because there is a link, a very big and very close nexus between participation and process, today we saw a very unfortunate incidence in terms of participation. We saw low voter turnout cut across board to the extent that some polling units were recording zero. Zero. I mean zero. And you are seeing one as a place. Very unfortunate. This is another, another, another unfortunate incident. It's, it's, it's something we should be unhappy about. But in terms of other like logistics, INEC did very well in terms of logistics, arrival to time, and many other things. And so when you accumulate all this, you would see that people could not see a reason to trust the electoral empire anymore. People could not see a reason again to come out. Some people say they cannot guarantee their life whether they will be safe. And so they can't go out. Because we saw video threats of people... Um, all right, uh, AK, I think uh, you've uh, summed up uh, the entire situation, you know, uh, speaking the minds of uh, quite a number of Nigerians there. Okay, Dr. Constance Koku is now with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Constance, you heard the uh, easy there. But uh, one worrisome uh, dimension is that of uh, the voters' inducement of vote buying. Uh, will you describe that as an improvement in the electoral system of fortune or the democratic culture of Nigeria? Sophistication in vote buying. Uh, vote buying has been going on for some time. Um, it, it's not new at all. I think what has happened over the last election and now is that politicians and parties are revising their playbook and changing them to suit um, what's going on now. So, for instance, before it used to be that uh, their thugs would go to uh, polling stations and snatch ballot boxes. Now that technology has been applied, it's almost meaningless to snatch those ballot boxes. So what we're now seeing is another strategy, which is, which is harassing voters, um, trying to subdue them, trying to untwist them and persecute them and force them literally to vote for a particular candidate. And we have seen that heavily in places like Lagos. And it's really a shame because Lagos is somewhere that this didn't happen, say, earlier in our democratic experience. It's a state where uh, everybody lived together and you could uh, vote for whomever you choose to. That this is happening is actually a dangerous trend. I think that people that are Lagosians, whether indigenous, well, Lagosians, indigenous and non-indigenous, would not like this to be the trademark of that state, of the commercial capital of the country. Lagos is the commercial capital of Nigeria. It means that everybody should live peacefully in Lagos. 
you, you can compare Lagos to New York, for instance, or London. So why should people be compelled or forced to do what they do not want to do because they belong to another ethnic group? So this is what we are seeing um, in this election, that the playbook is changing. Playbook changing is one thing, but for the fact that we'll see um, the outgoing president, Muhammad Buhari, after he cast his ballot in Kassina, he did say, um, if they give you money, collect it, but vote your candidate. And one wonders such a statement. But moving beyond that, and Dr. Constance Ikoku, I want to stay with you. Let's look at the fact that, yes, uh, Nigerians today have gone out to vote uh, 28 new chief executives, and from that number, we have about 11 of them who are incumbents seeking a second term. Eight of those are in the north and three in the south, speaking of Oyo, Ogun, and, uh, of course, Lagos State. Talk to us about the factors, really, that would lead to this incumbent, especially really retaining their seats from what we've seen so far. I mean, in Nigeria, we already know that uh, incumbency is, is powerful. It's a powerful advantage, especially at, at um, the governorship level. I said yesterday that most governors in Nigeria have so much power that they can literally do whatever they want to do. That's one thing. The second thing is, well, you might say that it's important to be a performing governor, and that would uh, give you another advantage if you decide to seek uh, to return to your seat. In most cases, that is not the case. Um, the mere fact that um, you know you have so much power, you know, it's it's easy literally to use what they call structures in Nigeria, which we now know that are criminal criminal ways of doing things, and you use that to to ride back to power. But the point then we have to make is. At the, at the state level, I think that we have to begin to educate people more. We have seen all the um, reports today across the states in terms of voter turnout. A lot of people did not turn out for various reasons. You know, so people have to understand that it is crucial for them to vote in the state governorship election. And of course, the, the state assembly as well, because the state assembly is the body or institution that makes the laws that govern the states. So this is no joke at all. All the money that comes from the federal government to the state level is, um, um, is, 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 is kept by the governor and the state assembly, and they make those decision, decisions that affect our lives at that level. So I think that there has to be more voter education uh, after this election. It has to be an ongoing exercise. We've talked about, you know, in this election, the INEC chairman said more than 80 million people uh, collected their voters card. And in the presidential election, just over 20 million people voted. Maybe by tomorrow, in the next couple of days, we will now know the count of how many people voted at the, at the governorship level. And I think it will be lower than at the presidential. So we have work to do as a growing democracy. You know, when there is high number of turnout, I think it becomes difficult for criminal politicians to do whatever they want to do and get away with it. But when there is low turnout, I think it's very easy for all sorts of characters that crawl out from the backyard to get into power. So it's something that we need to work on as a nation. Hmm. Well situated there, Dr. Constance. Well, let's go to our offsite studio where Eze is there. You heard there, Dr. Constance, there that one of the ways to remedy the deficits that we're having in our present democratic journey is a constant education of the populace. What other remedies would you be recommending despite the torrid and turbid situation? Thank you. Um I cannot agree less. For, for, for me, I would also recommend uh, that chiefly the electoral umpire, we need to do a lot of homework this time around. Uh, the reason is because, just like the judiciary, the confidence, confidence is what matters most when you talk about electoral umpire, the INEC. And that is why I think even in their name, uh, there is an attachment that they are meant to be independent. And that is where everything starts. Participation, the voting, and people believing in what we are talking about. Uh, like we all agreed that the last presidential and national assembly election had at least a leap, an improvement, an unexpected uh, spike in the way people sh uh, were excited and people turned up and suddenly their hope were dashed. 
And you know, especially this, the, the people we are talking about are mainly the young people where I happen to belong. And so they are easily, you know, they are easily irritated. They easily give up. Uh, uh, they, 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 so, and when you look at all this, uh, uh, INEC will now need to do a rebuilding. And literally, and that has to start by first of all, give details to Nigerians. What was these glitches? How did it happen? What actually triggered it? And so, you know, we have listening citizens. When we see that, we would accommodate, we accept our mistakes, and we forge our head. And we, the civil society, has been doing a lot of work since 12 February 25th. In fact, the success we record today, I can give it to civil society because, of course, you know, Heineck had been very busy with other plannings, reconfiguration of beavers and a lot of things, and meetings with Rex and so many things. But the civil society have not rested. We've been doing jingles. We've been doing the much we could do because we could not transverse France. And we've been and telling people that the state and the governorship election is the closest and should not be abandoned. You should not actually give up. And the beavers actually worked. We saw it today that what we had in the last election is not the, the malfunction of beavers or the failure of beavers, as people, some people perceive, but just human interference. And so we are saying that for human interference to be suffocated, that we need a large turnout. That was the angle the society were coming from. And so the INEC needs to have immediately after this election to first of all explain to Nigeria. Nigeria demand to know. Nigeria demand, and Nigeria is expecting. Look at the level of violence. Look at vote buying. The level we witness today is such embarrassing that people were giving rights. 1,000 naira. You know, our, our, our radar officers were seeing people giving clothes, and it was unbelievable. So we, this was, this is like taking us 10 steps back. Again, you know, this could not have happened. Janet, well, we a lot of civil society organizations will agree with you. They said beyond explaining, INEC needs to be probed. And of course, its books open. That so many things are not adding up, with, really. But with, with over 340 billion naira to conduct this election, why shouldn't they be probed? Absolutely. They must uh, account to the Nigerian people. You know what? Kenneth Eze and Dr. Constance Ikoku, you're still with us as we continue our coverage of, of course, the state governorship and state houses of assembly elections. But that would happen after this quick break. To stay with us. You're welcome back. You're still watching a special coverage of Nigeria's 2023 governorship and houses of assembly elections here on the rise news i am christian Ogodo. and i am amaka ude walker now to delta state where the governorship and the state house of assembly elections have actually uh, well been concluded while well, some voters attributed the low turnout to lack of confidence in the electorate by the INEC. And uh, our correspondent, Vietima George, actually has a, a story. Well, this time actually from Pot Hackett. Well, since our apologies for the mix up there. Well, would you have a story about the former Minister of Transportation, Christian? Rotimi Amechi, yes. Uh, he has described the governorship and House of Assembly election as a contest between opposition parties, the police, and INEC. That's quite loaded. Speaking to Arise News after casting his ballot at Ward 8, Unit 14 of Ubima in Ikure local government area of River State, the former governor also described the chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission, Mahmoud Yakubu, as an interested party in the polls. There is no election between APC and PDP or any other party. The election is between the other parties and the police and INEC. In fact, what you're seeing is a situation where the police is arresting everybody. They've arrested Charles Wanyayamu, they've arrested uh, Meka Ede, they've arrested the secretary of my party, of the party in the, my LGA, uh, and two others, the secretary of the Elders Committee. They, uh, they, they tried to arrest uh, Simon Control. They tried to arrest some few persons in, uh, in uh, Thai and Gokana. And, if you see the arrests all over the state, boiling to one thing, the police colluding with Yeso uh, Mwike to deliver PDP. Is that an election? And they have no shame. Uh, to what's the matter, the INEC uh, chairman is the worst. 
having worked under BK as his executive secretary for Ted Fund, he has just collapsed, collapsed the river state. He said the reason for which he allowed, he canceled the election, stopped election the last time in 2019 was violence. Now there's predominantly heavy violence, heavy shooting. Natives are not, I mean, uh, non indigenous are not allowed to vote. The people are being flogged up and down. Why has he not stopped the election? It's just simply because he has an interest. And I, I don't know why, for the past two elections, the chairman of INEC influences the appointment of PDP card carrying members as uh, uh, returning officers and SPOs and POs. He influences the appointment of REC, Residential Re Electoral Commissioner, University. and so they just come here to, to do election, which is between the other parties and INEC. Rotimi Amechi there, the former, uh, of course, River State Governor and uh, former Minister of Transportation. And perhaps a common thread in the election across several states was that of voter turnout and that it was low. And uh, speaking about voter turnout, let's uh, turn to River State now where there was voter apathy in the capital pot hackett and some voters attributed the low turnout to a lack of confidence in the electoral umpire, INEC. And our correspondent, Sophia Timur George, has more in this report. Ad hoc staff of the INEC waited for voters in some polling units at the Ajib area of Port Hackett, the River State capital. In another polling unit, other ad hoc staff of the INEC were busy attending to voters who had come to perform their civic duties. The turnout seems far short of the mark in comparison with the presidential and national assembly elections. 25th of February, we had a good turnout and people were ready to vote. But what I feel today is a lot of persons are heartbroken because the outcome of what they did, they had on the 25th, was not actually reflected. But I just had to come because I had to exercise my own franchise. The last election we had over 500 persons, and today, you can see the crowd, we are less than 200. People are really not happy about what happened the last time, so the turnout you know, is what you can see behind me. But we are really not happy. And we hope that INEC will do what they promised. We hope that our votes will count. We hope that the results will be uploaded real time. No matter what happened, we still have this confidence that uh, the right thing will be done. Even the 25th uh, February, we still have the confidence that the right thing will be done. We still have the confidence. That's why I'm coming here today to vote. A third polling unit in the Ajib area has more persons quite enthusiastic to exercise their franchise in an orderly manner. Just a few kilometers away, some youth had taken up the space to play football on election day. On the 5th of uh, February, we cast our votes normal and there, there was a lot of turnout. I was even number 202 there about, queuing in line. We don't even have time for all this uh, football. But today the difference is very, very clear. There was nobody there. Nobody. Everybody felt that for the fact that the, 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 the first one did not count, then why then do we come and uh, 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 waste our time? So let's say, uh, but normally I have gone, I've gone and done my own duty. The last one we voted, we voted, the party we voted for, we were supposed to, as we, as we were expecting the winner, but what we were expecting was what, what we had. We had another different result. So there's no need of voting. That's, that's the reason you're playing football on election day? Yes. Number 50, Godwin and Mefele. <laughs> Of Vietnam George, Arise News. All right, let's go back to Delta State where the governorship and state house of assembly elections commenced peacefully, but a pocket of violence was recorded here and there in some parts of the state. And Jemima Baloko tells us more. The beginning, the governorship and state house of assembly elections started with high hopes as voters trooped out in their numbers. However, this enthusiasm did not last. In some communities, the exercise turned ugly. In Osubi, Okwe local government area of Delta State, the People's Democratic Party governorship candidate Sheriff Oboroore cast his vote at 9.55 a.m. He says the electoral process was peaceful and helps to win. Uh, you know, Nigeria, we want democracy and uh, the truth of it is that that's the only way we can have peace in this country. Uh, 
we know that we are going to achieve it with the process of this uh, voting. If it goes round, that what is happening in my unit is what is happening across the whole 270 worlds. Yeah, because we have worked very hard as a party. We have worked very hard, we have gone around the 270 worlds, done uh, committee, committee, committee to community uh, campaigns, done unit to unit. So we've done very well, we've worked very hard. Governor of Delta State, Ifai Nokowa, also commends the process in his hometown, Owa Elero, Ika Northeast of Delta State. Yeah, the, the, the weavers works, there will be transmission uh, in this current election. I hope that they don't come back to give us any more reasons why uh, uh, results are not transmitted on the following year. Meanwhile, in Orogun, the Deputy Senate President of Nigeria, Ovi Omar Gigi, who is governorship candidate of the All Progressive Congress Party, voted at 11.11 a.m. He says his polling unit is peaceful but expresses concerns about other units and he also believes victory will be his at the end of the exercise. Uh, and, uh, the momentum was there all along uh, coming into uh, the polling today. I expect at the end of the day we will be declared the winner. But I haven't said so. Uh, the PDP entered into this contest uh, with uh, a predetermination to ensure that uh, attacks are launched on the polling units uh, across the state, most especially here in uh, Delta Central, uh, to destroy the votes uh, since uh, the morning. We've received reports of those attacks in pulling units in Ewereni. We've received the same in, uh, in uh, uh, Ugeli South. However, the exercise is not as peaceful in some communities. But I said it for SPOs are here, and no one is carrying number. And it's probably that was an oversight that we sent. We really sent some, some peace to my phone, for which I don't understand. But that was that. But um, the major challenge we faced here was the um, issue of vote buying. The rate of vote buying in this unit was high. And um, other units I visited too as a candidate, the rate was also high. We had a lot of um, talks from the opposition party, PDP who insisted that uh, it is their right for people to vote and show their vote to the respective party they belong to. All effort to stop them resorted to issues. Jemima Boloko, Arise News, Delta. Of course, let's bring right. in uh, Arise News Analyst Dr. Constance Sikoku as well as Kenneth Eze. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Well, Dr. Constance Sikoku, look at those reports that we've just had before uh, coming on air with regards to violence. Particularly, I want to look at River State, which has a history of inconclusive elections in the first ballot. And from reports that we have gathered today, would you know that uh, um, elections are not hold in two local government areas? And for a state that has about three 3.5 million registered voters. Low voter turnout was still an issue. What would you say is the reason why River State, for every election cycle, reports like this always come out? Well, yes, R Rivers is, is a difficult place. I think it has to do with the attitude of the political players. It's interesting listening to former, um, no, is it former Minister Amechi, former yeah, governor? Former. Former yeah, former, well. former governor Amechi um, talking about INEC and um, almost poo pooing INEC and his party, he belongs to the APC, and saying that they are literally working together to um, sort of do what they're not supposed to do. Um, but he belongs to the APC, he is part of the people that worked very hard to make sure that President Muhammad Buhari became the president in River State where uh, most of the people were against um, the APC. He led the charge and of course he was rewarded with uh, a ministerial position. 
So I, I, do, I don't think that uh, people will be listening to him very much. But let's look at INEC. Um, I know that everybody has said, many people have said that INEC has problems or has uh, uh, serious challenges. It does have irres its responsibilities and failures. At the same time, I would like us to look at the political culture. I do not think that INEC alone can deliver um, a great election to the country. The political culture also plays a very strong role. Look at what we've seen today. When politicians decide that they would maybe buy up INEC officials or ad hoc staff or permanent staff or go to the poll you know, and send their people to disrupt the process. Even they disrupt the process, what has INEC got to do with that? So we have to begin to have a broader discussion about what kind of people get into politics? What are the incentives? What are the incentives that are making desperate people to get into politics, not to serve, but um, maybe to, to use the word, to share the national cake? So this is a discussion that needs to be had. Maybe when um, leadership posi positions are disincentivized, and it, then people will not want to go there. If you decide that you want to go there to serve, then it's strictly to work in the interest of the people. So I think that we have to look at that as well, apart from, from INEC. All right, let's uh, cross uh, to Aze, Kenneth Aze, who is in our uh, oversight uh, studio. Kenneth, that uh, very daunting uh, description of INEC and its leadership by a key member of the All Progressives Congress, former Minister of Transportation, former Governor of River State, is, you know, um, is, uh, says a lot about the capacity of INEC, about the integrity of INEC in, I mean, for Nigeria's democracy to really move forward. Should this present INEC still be in existence? Thank you. Um, we should know one thing that the politicians, the political actors, uh, the ones where uh, things are actually favoring them. Uh, when you see a politician crying, it means he couldn't uh, have his way. Uh, we, uh, for me, at the civil society um, end, uh, we, we don't. Um, uh, want to actually rely on what the political class are saying because of course we know uh, they are interested party in what we are saying. And so, but for us, uh, what matters to us is the report from the Nigerian people. What we saw in the field, the voter party we saw, the vote buying, the, 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 the voter party which we went further. In fact, before now, we had, we, had, we, had, we had gauged what we call the vote beat of Nigerians because we foresaw this. We saw, that was why we were shouting, that INEC thrives on confidence and trust. It takes confidence, it takes trust for people to actually believe you. And, of, you know, what, 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 what is, is really making us to actually feel so bad is that this INEC led by Professor Mahmoud, enjoyed the maximum support from Nigerians. And I say it with all confidence. Uh, I don't think there is any INEC chairman uh, that actually enjoyed the, the massive support from the civil society, from the Nigerian people, from international community. In case we forgot, we, you saw how the international community observers were very disappointed. They, they enjoyed, you know, when we talk about over 300 billion provided for the commission, that is on the part of the government. What about the development partners? What about other money that we are not even aware of? And so, for example, look at the issue of PWD. Do you know that the PWD, as we speak, no provision was made for them? Even when there are provisions in the budget of INEC, and we are still waiting for explanation. And so, you see poly units, poly boots be kept in a place where a blind person cannot climb. There is no magnifying lenses. Nothing was provided for them. And so we, we are feeling like this because INEC had no reason to give Nigeria what they gave us. That does not mean that they failed completely. No. We are, I have enumerated places where they did well. But what we are saying is that they will have done far better. And what we are saying is that it is now 
we are, need, we are now going to start afresh again to begin to rebuild that trust process. By now, we should not be talking about that. We should be talking about the lesson learned where we did not get it and to be able to perfect it in the next electoral uh, 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 voyage that we are going to you know, embark on. But look at the case now. As it is now, we are the mercies of the judiciary. But thank God that the judiciary is part and parcel of the democracy. We should also know this. Because I have seen so many people, um, maybe out of the knowledge that, the, 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 that is at their beck and call, they see judiciary, each time uh, uh, a case is going to judiciary, they see judiciary as that, uh, it shouldn't go that. No, for, all, for me, I see judiciary as a part of the system. It's a part of the component of democracy. And so, just like we have other aspects, judiciary also has their role. Thank you and very so much. Now, uh, now Kenneth, uh, we're running out of time. Sorry to badge in. Uh, I just uh, had to do that so that... Uh, absolutely. <laughs> judiciary absolutely is, <laughs> is the hope of, of, the, of the common man. So, yeah. And Dr. Costa Sikoku, before we wrap up this conversation, um, one other issue that plagued the elections today was low voter turnout. Some would say, you know, the interest for the presidential and national assembly is more than this, which some would say is unfortunate because the governors and the state house of a assembly closer to the people but yet here we are but let's look at you know moving forward what are the lessons you'd say we have learned or we should be learning that can avoid such a situation where we have about 87 million pvcs collected for the presidential less than 30 million people decided who our next president will be and for a state like kano that has over 5.9 million registered voters from the irev i'm not seeing up to 2 million people who are voting for the next governor of the state. Well, credibility is important. When you have an institution that seems to have lost all sense of decency and that carries out an election that is below par, you know, according to everybody that has uh, made, you know, discussed this election, whether it's local observers or international observers, people are bound to be heartbroken. I mean, I had so many calls today from distressed Nigerians across the country wanting to share what they were going through at the polling uh, centers. And they were thinking that at least if they could you know, get to someone that works in a television station, they will feel better that their voices will be heard. Credibility is important. Who is the person that you appointed as INEC chairman? What about the staff? You know, and let's do an audit of that institution. The money that is given, the funds that are given for them to carry out elections, after elections, do they ask questions or are they answerable? They should be answerable. What did you do with this money? Uh, how was it spent? Was it spent judiciously? Did something go wrong? Did we get value for our money? Um, like I said before, we should be running government institutions like you know, private sector institutions. In that way, you, you match, uh, you, you know, you match sort of the funds that you give, you match it with, um, you know, you, you want to see value. You want to see that you, you do something with it. And if, if that is not the case, then you shouldn't be in that seat anymore. All right. Thanks so very much. No better place to drop the anchor on this segment of uh, our special coverage of Nigeria State Governorship and Houses of Assembly elections. We've been speaking with Dr. Constance Ikoku and um, Kenneth Eze. Executive Director of Speaker. Thanks very much for gracing uh, our special coverage.